Thank you, ma'am. And uh, once again, good morning to all present here. And on behalf of Indian Women Scientists Association, IWSA, I am delighted to extend once again a warm welcome to all of you uh, to today's webinar on defects in academia and research, understanding risk and opportunities. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the Department of Information Technology and BK Merla College Kalyan for the gracious invitation to speak on this uh, very important subject. Uh, I should admit that their commitment to fostering knowledge and understanding the emerging technology is highly commendable, and I'm honored to be part of this uh, uh, collaborative effort. Now, uh, before I get into what I am supposed to discuss, we need to understand that in today's digital age, where information flows more rapidly than ever before, the phenomena of defect has taken the center stage. Whether you know it or not, but it is there. Defects, which is a product of cutting edge artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies, they have the potential to revolutionize various sectors, including academia and research. However, like any powerful tool, they come with a set of complex challenges and ethical considerations that we must navigate. Defects in academia and research, understanding risk and opportunities, is basically a topic of paramount importance in the current context. As a researcher, as an educator, as a student, we rely on the integrity of information and authenticity of the research outcomes. Defects have, uh, I hope I am audible. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, thank you. thank you. So when you look at defects, defects have the capability to blur the line between the facts and the fiction, raising the question about the reliability uh, of the digital content in the academic sphere to be very specific. So this webinar basically serves as a platform for us to delve into the critical subject, explore its nuance, and equip ourselves with the knowledge needed to safeguard the integrity of academia and research. So the objective is very, very clear. I guess we are not going to get into too much details, but at least we should get to the level where we understand the intricacies of this topic. So in the next possibly two hours, we will try to unravel the world of defects, examining the risks they pose, opportunities they offer, and the ethical and the legal considerations that accompany their use. So I'm ex excited to discuss some complex landscapes and share insights that I believe will be instrumental or uh, instrumental in our collaborative understanding of the subject. But this webinar is not just about one-way communication. I will expect at the end we should have some kind of an mutual exchanges so that we uh, understand the subject uh, very um, better. Okay, so without delaying much, okay, so I should just go ahead and talk about what we are supposed to do here. Now, defects have become a very prominent concern prim primarily in the today's digital landscape. So if I talk about defects, okay, defects are short for deep learning fix, okay, which are a class of synthetic media created using artificial intelligence technique, particularly deep learning algorithms. These AI-driven algorithms analyze and manipulate existing audio, video, and image content, okay, and now any kind of data, okay, basically to create highly convincing but entirely fabricated content. As I just said that they refer to synthetic or heavily manipulated media that convincingly imitate reality. Okay, so blurring the line between what is genuine and what is fabricated. So deep fake encompasses a wide range of media. As I said, that image, video, audio, and now even the text or any other kind of data that you deal. Okay, they have been generated. Okay, they have been altered using some sophisticated algorithmic techniques or AI techniques. They employ deep learning algorithm, okay, with a subset of artificial, which is a, nothing but a subset of artificial intelligence to analyze and manipulate data to create highly realistic and deceptive content. At their core, defects involve the use of generative neural networks, which are capable of understanding and imitating the patterns in the data. These networks are trained on vast amount of real data, such as video of people speaking, and then employ this knowledge to generate new content that appears genuine. This technology has rapidly advanced in recent years, making it increasingly challenging to distinguish between the authentic and manipulated media. Now, deep fakes are a direct outcome of the advancement of the deep learning algorithms, okay, which is inspired by the functioning of human brain 
okay, learn patterns and features from the vast amount of data. They can generate highly complex and realistic output, making them susceptible to misuse in the creation of the deep fix. So as an individual, as an academician, as a student, as a researcher, I need to understand that what's real, what's fake, and where the real and the fakes can be useful. Okay, at the same time, we need to understand that where they can be deceptive and it could be harmful. Initially, deep learning technology was primarily focused on positive applications, okay, such as image recognition, natural language processing, medical diagnosis, etc., and so on. However, as the technology evolved, malicious actors began leveraging uh, it to create deceptive and misleading content leading to the rise of the deep fakes. So in essence, deep fakes are the digital form of impersonation where AI systems are used to create content that appears genuine, but is in fact artificially generated. Their rise poses both exciting opportunities and profound challenges, uh, specifically in the realm of academy and the research where the authenticity and the credibility of the data is going to be of most importance. So in the next, a uh, few slides okay in our discussion we will be trying to go deeper into this i'll talk about the history and the evolution and how it is in the uh, relevant in the current context so talking about the evolution if you see that okay evolution uh, of the deep fakes okay you can consider it to be a little bit recent but it is not so recent okay you can say that last two decades have been basically the seed for the same so if you look at early 2000s, okay, they were the early foundations of the today's deep fake. Okay, so if you uh, look at 2000, okay, early research in computer vision and machine learning laid the groundwork for the deep fakes today. In year 2003, okay, face substitution technique was developed using the 3D modeling and animation. Okay, which emerged in the film industry. In fact, during the same time, okay, near about 4, 000, 2004 and five, I also did something which was basically a volume based. Um, say morphing technique, okay, which was also a kind of a first step towards the current defect. In 2010, if you see that the emergence of the deep learning came into picture, okay, people started realizing the power of deep learning, although it was not in the true, true form. True form came somewhere in 2014, 15 aspas, and deep learning techniques, specifically like convolution neural networks, Okay, began to show their significant promises in the image and the video analysis. 2015 and 16 saw another leap. Okay, so if you look at 2015, okay, Deep Dream, uh, which was a, basically a Google project, showcased the potential of the neural network to generate serial and artificial, say, imageries. Okay, face to face, which was basically the uh, real time facial replacement system in 2016, demonstrated early capabilities of manipulating the facial expression in the videos. 2017, you see that the term deep fake okay, was coined by Reddit. So practically, if you see talk about deep learning and deep fake kind of things, okay, they are quite recent in 2017, 18K aspas, which made it very popular technology, okay, for various purposes. In 2018, if you see that there was an explosive growth, okay, so last 2017 to early 2018, you'll find out that deep learning technology became more accessible with release of user-friendly applications and the tools. Graphics cards came into picture, which allowed you to have heavy computing at your own desktops. Okay, so Therefore, it became quite popular and now reachable to everybody. In the late, uh, say, or, or mid uh, 2018, you'll find out deep fake video featuring former President Barack Obama. Okay, once about the technology uh, potential misuse, people started realizing that what harm it can also do. At the later stage, you'll find out that they deep fake gain mainstream attention with uh, realistic impersonation of celebrities in the adult videos leading to uh, ethical debates and calling for the regulation. And that's why you'll see that people who are from the security domain, they will always say that, okay, never try to post your videos or the photos online because every piece of information that you are posting is consumed. And now deep fakes are the place where you will see that you will be present at any other place where you should not be, okay? So in 2019 and 2020, you'll find out the increasing realism of the deep fakes took place. Okay, Facebook came into picture and then other uh, big players started coming and uh, doing the research into this. In 2020s, you see that advancement and the ethical concern gained more uh, popularity. Okay, and uh, in present context, if you talk about 2023, where we are right now. Okay, so this is basically a time where academic exploration 
okay is of paramount importance because as an academician as a researcher now we have to tackle this kind of a problem we started with something which is very useful very interesting entertaining and so on now which is actually going into the very disastrous and a very dark uh, domain so uh, deep fix have become the subject of academic research with uh, with interdisciplinary studies exploring their implications in various fields and if you talk about future which is basically an ongoing innovation i'll say that as the technology continues to advance deep fix capabilities will likely become more sophisticated necessitating uh, the on ongoing research and the vigilance so the history and the evolution of the deep fix basically showcases the rapid progression of ai driven media manipulation Okay, from early experiments to the mainstream awareness, okay, an ethical concern. Okay, we are in the midst of what we need to look into. So in next part of our discussion, I'll try to examine the prevalence of the deep fakes in the academy and the research, trying to focus on some specific examples and the, uh, what do you say, um, their relevance. Now, before I get into the deep fakes, okay, I need to establish the connection with the uh, deep learning. Okay, so if you look at deep fakes, they are fascinating but concerned development in the digital age. They are uh, intimately uh, connected to um, uh, areas of the artificial intelligence, which is nothing but deep learning. Okay, so I have already told you that what is deep learning? It's a subset of AI, okay, which has a capability to process and understand vast amount of data. Okay, and it can enable the creation and the manipulation of incredibly realistic media, okay, including videos and the audio. Okay, why we are discussing about video and audio? Because that is something which is very much uh, seen in the real life, but it is applicable to anywhere and everywhere. So what's impressive in these algorithms is that they are not just limited to replicating appearances. They can mimic the um, in mimic, mimic anything, including the human behavior, including voice inflections, facial expressions, etc., and so on. So the magic happens during the basically the training. Deep learning models are fed enormous amount of data sets containing wide range of visual, auditory cues, or any other kind of textual data. This process allows them to capture and replicate their cues with remarkable precision. As deep learning has become more powerful and access, uh, accessible, uh, it has demonstrated the creation of or uh, demonstrated and I can say democratized the, the creation of deep fix. Now, even individuals with limited technical knowledge, they can produce convincing synthetic media. If time permits, I'll try to show you some of the things that we have been working on very recently. However, their accessibility comes with a challenge. Okay, Distinguishing between the authentic and manipulated media has become a real puzzle. The deception can be so convincing that telling them apart from genuine content is increasingly becoming very, very difficult. This is where importance of robust detection technique and proactive strategies come into the play. In order to combat misuse of defect technologies, we need to have reliable methods for identifying their synthetic creation, addressing their associated risk. And that is the place where academia, research, students, faculties, all the... Uh, yeah. So let me talk about now the generative AI to deep fix. Okay, so the journey of... Um, journey from the deep learning to deep fix basically marks the fascinating and the transformative evolution of the AI and its application. Okay, the introduction of generative AI, specifically the generative adversarial network or GAN and variational encoders. Okay, they further accelerated the progress of deep learning, GAN, deep learning. And GAN, which was proposed by Goodfellow and his team in year 2015, uh, 2014 and 15, they actually introduced a novel way to generate data by, uh, say, pitting two uh, neural network against each other or computing two neural networks against each other. One was called as a generative uh, network or another was called as a discriminator uh, network. The generator basically tries to produce a data that resembles the real data while the discriminator attempts to differentiate between the real and the fake data. So through this adversarial training, GAN became highly proficient in uh, generating realistic images and videos and even audios. So with the emergence of the GAN and variational encoders, deepfake entered into the scene. Deepfakes refer to the synthetic media, as I already told you, which is basically often manipulated and created using the real techniques. Okay, so which is very convincing and mimicking the real content. Initially, deepfakes uh, were popular in the entertainment and the social media, where they were used for fun and creative purpose. 
Okay, such as face swapping in the video and generating realistic voice impersonation, etc. and so on. However, as the deep fake technology advanced, it started infiltrating the scientific community and raised concern about the scientific integrity. The same AI-driven tool that facilitated creativity and artistic expression were now posing potential risk to authenticity of the scientific research. Manipulated media, fabricated experimental result or entirely fake result or research studies could undermine the credibility of the scientific publication and hinder the progress of knowledge. So this transition from creative use to potentially malicious application, raising the ethical and the technical challenge came into picture. Detecting and identifying the deep fakes becomes crucial in maintaining and uh, maintaining the trustworthiness of information and ensuring the reliability of the scientific research. The scientific community needs to be vigilant, proactive in addressing this potential threat which is posed by the deep fix. And that is why we are discussing things today. As a deep fake technolo technology involved, okay, there's a shift from artistic and benign application to more harmful intention, impacting areas like politics, journalism, uh, and uh, academia. The ease of creating sophisticated deep fakes coupled with their realistic appearance amplifies the need for the robust defense and the detect mecha uh, detection mechanism. Addressing these challenges posed by the defect require ongoing research, collaboration between the researchers, industry experts, policy makers, and commitment to maintaining, maintaining the ethical practices. So by staying at the forefront of the defect detection technique and detection technique, the scientific community can safeguard the integrity of the research and protect the uh, trust placed by uh, public in the scientific publications and the work. So we are here to basically look into it and delve into it and see what exactly it means. Okay, so just a minute, I need to share once again. Yeah. Hmm. So I'm just trying to show you some of the examples of the deep fakes, which you are all aware and you have been coming across, but it gives you the potential of Okay, what defects can do. Okay, so here there are some examples where you see that people have created okay defect videos where the person is actually not there, but you are uh, assuming that the person is there. Person is actually not speaking what it, uh, uh, is being audible and so on. Okay, so therefore you will see that it could be really harmful in many of the situations. Now this thing can be taken to the next level where it can generate any kind of data which may be in the defect domain. Now the first video that I'm just You're trying to show you is Wyoming. basically... We interrupt uh, our normal Donald programming Trump. for coverage of the presidential who address. Is speaking and uh, telling you a story. Hi, kids. I'm Donald Trump, your president, and I'm going to read you a story. It's a very special story about a very special reindeer. Once upon a time in the forest, there was a little reindeer. All the reindeers agreed he was the best reindeer out of all the reindeers. The next day, a grumpy old sleepy-eyed reindeer came into town and started saying, you know the reindeer who's awesome? You know what? He's not, he's not awesome. But he is awesome. Every All the reindeers said, but he's awesome. I think that we should have an election. I mean, like a vote to see who is the only way everybody knows he ever again. This has been Channel 9. Well, basically, you see that President, former President Donald Trump, okay, is telling the story to the kids. Now, actually, this is a deep fake video, okay? It was not an original video. It was created, synthetically manipulated. Now, if it is a story, it could be anything, okay? It could be addressed to the nation. It could be anything. And now you see in the uh, era of the social media, okay, people tend to believe anything what they see and they hear. Now, this is going to be one of the very big challenge, okay? Let me just show you some more examples. Okay. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time, even if they would never say those things. So, uh, for instance, they could have me say things like, uh, I don't know, uh, Killmonger was right, or uh, Ben Carson is in the sunken place, or how about this, simply, President Trump is a total and complete dipshit. Now, you see, I would never say these things. 
at least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the Internet. That's a time when we need to rely on trusted news sources. It may sound basic, but how we move forward in the age of information is going to be the difference between whether we survive or whether we become some kind of fucked up dystopia. Thank you. And stay woke, bitches. Okay, so you see that this is an example of deep fake video as well as the audio. Okay, so what kind of media is being created? And this is only because of the deep learning technologies that we have now. You're watching. Okay, so this is another some set of examples that you see. Now, this is basically an other application where you see that synthetic or a deep fake music is being generated. Okay, original music is something different. And on the similar line, the music is being created. And it is very difficult to basically identify that this music is not created by its creators. Now, this could be really a matter of copyright infringements to other kind of problems that you will be having. Okay, so let me just demonstrate some of the things. So you're copying the style of somebody. So, and this is another one. And I cannot lie. You other brothers can deny that when a girl walks in with an itty bitty waist and a round thing in your face, you get strong. This is an audio fake. She noticed it, but was stuck. So, the what you see here is that there is a lot of potential that you can see where a lot of deep fakes can be created. Okay, so therefore. Okay, it becomes very, very important for us, okay, to understand this technology and look into it. Okay, so if you look at the uh, why, why academia and the research should be concerned about this fix. Okay, so deep fakes are basically the double-edged sword, presenting both opportunities and the threat that demand the attention of academia and research. Okay, you'll see that from data authenticity uh, and credibility to ethical considerations, misinformation, deceptions, and all those things, as I have just listed down onto these slides. Okay, so these are some of the things that necessitates that you need to be concerned about. Okay, as we talk about the data authenticity, okay, data defects can compromise the authenticity and the credibility of the data in academia and the research. Manipulated audio, video, image content can lead to erroneous conclusion and undermine the trustworthiness of the research outcome. Okay, while at the same time, there's an opportunity also, okay, the research in the defect detection and the verification method can enhance the data integrity and bolster the uh, credibility of some research finding where the data is not really available. Okay, so you see that there are so many parameters on which you can actually uh, look into and you should understand that why you are important in this entire scenario. Okay, you'll see that as far as the misinformation deception is concerned, the threat is defects, spreads misinformation, opportunity, you can develop tools to combat deceptions now. Again, uh, impact on academic integrity, I have discussed research opportunities, okay, educational innovation, okay, it can be really useful in some educational purpose, okay, specifically when you want to have an science e experiments, okay, so they, sometimes it could be really useful, however, it can also go wrong in some cases. Okay, so if there is a misuse of defects in education, it could confuse and misinform students, okay, knowledge sharing and awareness may, again, you are going to have problems. Okay, they are, uh, developing a countermeasure is another uh, area that you need to be concerned about. Okay, so therefore you'll see that as an academia and research, okay, so you need to look into uh, the possibilities, okay, that the fakes actually give. Okay, it has both positive outcomes, it has all negative outcomes, you need to have a control between them, okay, and uh, wherever it is possible that you can use it for good, please do that. Okay, wherever it is going into the dark domain, okay, try to have a strategy to mitigate the, the same. Now, let me talk about some of the techniques and the technologies that go behind these kind of things. Okay, so 
generative adversarial network and auto encoders were the primary things that we discussed. Okay, I'll be just very briefly trying to talk about the generative ad adversarial network and uh, so on. I guess if you look at the, uh, what do you say, generative adversarial network, which is uh, the cornerstone of the defect technology, they consist of basically neural network, um, two neural network, which is generator and the discriminator, which is engaged in the continuous adversarial process. And here the generator network uh, creates a synthetic contents and um, by basically learning the pattern in the data, it aims to generate content that is indistinguishable from the data, while at the same time, the discriminator network evaluates the content and uh, discerning between the real and the synthetic data. It provides a feedback sometimes to the generator to in order to improve the output. And there's an adversarial process that keeps on going. So GAN is basically engaging in a constant back and forth process. And the generator strives to create more convincing content while the discriminator becomes better and better in detecting the fakes. This results in generating increasingly realistic deep fakes finally. Okay, so if you just try to see that there is a generator which is trying to generate a fake note and discriminator is trying to detect that that is a fake. And sometimes if he is able to detect that it is a fake money, then in that case, he is giving the feedback saying that, look, I have detected you. And now he is going to improve. And there will be some time at the later stage where the synthetic or the uh, what's a manipulated node is going to be as good as a real where it cannot be detected. And that is the place where you will see that you will start landing up into the problems. Now, as I told you that there are other technologies that are using, uh, use, you are using it in the background, you have auto encoders. Okay, there are another technology that is using the day fake creation, okay, mainly in the images and the manipulation of audios. Uh, it has got basically an encoding and decoding stages where an auto encoder uh, tries to uh, use the encoder to compress the input data into a lower dimensional uh, representation, which is basically called as an encoding, while the decoder basically reconstructs the original data from uh, the encoding. Now, the encoder maps the input data to the latent space, which is a lower dimensional, uh, while the decoder maps the latent representation back to the original input data. Now, the encoder typically consists of series of convolution of fully connected layers that reduce the dimensionality of the input data. Now, if you look at the deep fakes okay, application in this context, you'll see that auto encoders have been used in, manipula uh, used in manipulated images or audio by encoding and altering the representations in the way that they make changes, which is imperceptible to the human eye or to the ear. There are other technologies that go behind okay, when you are going to work with the deep fakes, okay, either for creation or for detection, both the purposes, in fact. Okay, so these are being listed onto your slides. Okay, you will see that uh, you have the RNNs or the recurrent neural networks, which is used for generating the sequence of data, making them suitable for tasks like generating realistic speech or text in the deep fake audio and the video. CNNs are going to be used particularly useful when uh, image-based deep fakes. Banate. Uh, they are going to be good at capturing the spatial pattern and the features, making them valuable for make, uh, manipulating the visual contents. Uh, variational autoencoder, they are similar to autoencoder, but they are going to be used for generating data with continuous attributes. They can be applied in uh, creating continuous uh, variation in the deep fake contents. Deep learning, reinforcement learning is another important thing where we are uh, using the techniques to uh, train models for more dynamic and interactive deep fakes, such as generating the natural sounding down dialogues in the videos. You have transfer learning, another thing that is coming up, okay, which takes, makes use of the pre-trained models and fine tuning them to specific deep fake tasks. Okay, so it speeds up basically the training process and improve the result if you are going to use the pre-trained models. And now a lot of pre-trained models are available. Natural language processing, obviously, you see that it can be utilized in generating the coherent and contextually relevant text for the defect voiceovers and the dialogues. Apart from this, there are other supplementary tools that you can use or techniques you can use okay, during all of these works so where you have face alignment and pose estimation. You have voice synthesis, 3D modeling, super resolution technique. Specifically, if you talk about specific uh, super resolution technique. Uh, this is basically trying to uh, enhance the quality and the resolution of the deep fake images in the video or the video, making them appear to be more convincing. Okay, something if you have a very old video which is recorded in a very, uh, what do you say, 
low resolution okay you can increase the re resolution but at the same time you see that there's going to be some kind of a generative content now if you can make it a low resolution to high resolution with such kind of uh, precession okay it is also possible to embed new characters or new things within the same okay that is going to be an opportunity and the threat at the same time motion capture and another uh, transfer is another thing that uh, you are going to be concerned with okay which will um, be applied basically to ensure the body movement and the gestures okay are kept at good again okay, the deep fake videos closely mimicking those that are of the target individual and in fact we have just seen into our uh, what do you say examples so if you see that the first category okay comprises of the core deep learning technologies that are fundamental to the deep fake creation uh, these techniques form the basis of gener generating and manipulating media contents the second uh, category includes supplementary techniques and tools that is used to enhance the realism and the quality of the deep fix and address a specific aspect of creation process. Together, these categories basically uh, are going to be seen as the key technologies that are involved in deep fake generation at the same time. Uh, what is a detection also. So it is very important to note that the effectiveness of the defect creation dep depends upon the combination of these technologies and the skills of the creator. So the, fe the field of defect technology continues to evolve rapidly with researchers and their developers uh, exploring innovative web to approaches to make the fakes more convincing and challenging uh, to detect. Now, the question is that what is the impact on to the scientific com community? Okay, so I can say that with my understanding and with some years of research in the past, okay, the fact that the fakes have profound impact on scientific integrity and the trust, okay, specifically in the academic domain, okay, and the research community. Okay, falsified data, manipulated experimental results, entirely fabric fabricated research studies can mislead and undermine scientific process. Okay, and uh, I'll, if time permits, I'll try to show you some of the real uh, fake experimental uh, okay, data also. Now, if you look at the deep fakes, you'll find out that this is going to pose challenge to the scientific integrity to the, uh, and the trust. Okay, you'll see that it is going to be substantial challenge to maintaining scientific integrity. Okay, the, the uh, dissemination of falsified data and manipulated experiment result is going to erode the credibility of the scientific finding. Fabricated research studies, okay, will be convincingly presenting uh, things as genuine. And they can mislead other researchers, waste resources, and uh, hinder the scientific progress. Defects can also undermine the scientific progress by introducing the fraudulent information into the body of scientific uh, knowledge. When falsified data and manipulated results are published, other researchers may build upon these false foundations, leading to the cascade of incorrect assumption and the conclusion. This is going to undermine the reliability and the reproducibility of the research findings. Okay, and therefore hindering the achievements and the waste, uh, wasting of the valuable resources. Imagine that uh, some 80 years, 19 years back, okay, people who gave the principles of the physics, etc., and so on. If it was false and it was fairly fabricated or it was basically uh, fake, then in that case, where we could have reached. So that is going to be one of the very, very big challenge as of now. So the potential consequence of deep fakes in scientific community is far reaching in fact. The reputation of the researchers and the institutions can be tarnished if they work if their work becomes associated with the deep fakes. Public trust in the scientific community may diminish if the authenticity and the accuracy of the research findings are questioned. The consequences extend beyond the individual researchers to the wide scientific ecosystem, affecting collaborations, funding, public, uh, public perception of science at large. So the scientific community must grapple with the challenges posed by the deep fakes to uh, preserve scientific integrity. Researchers and institutions must be vigilant in detecting and addressing the presence of deep fake in the scientific publications implementing robust verification process and fostering a cultural culture of transparency and open science is going to be essential in combating the potential influence of the deep fix so if i just say that deep fix presents significant challenge to the scientific integrity and the test potential consequences could be disastrous so recognizing the implication of the deep fix and taking proactive measures to detect 
and address and prevent their influence into the scientific uh, or uh, science and the academia is going to be of paramount importance okay and therefore none of you can be okay uh, um, can can you uh, say afford, afford to overlook this in fact so let me just talk about the opportunities at the same time Okay, so deep learning along with the connection to the deep fakes, okay, they present both opportunity and the challenges for the science and the research. Okay, the wild deep fakes have raised concerns as we have just discussed about the trust and the integrity. There are certain benefits also that you are going to have for these digital link technologies, okay, in specific domains. So if you talk about the first thing, I'll say that the generation of the synthetic data is one of the very big advantage that I see. Okay, so deep learning based effects basically provide you the opportunity to generate synthetic data that can augment limited and unavailable data set. This can be particularly useful in scenarios where acquiring the real world data is challenging, expressing or ethically sensitive. So synthetic data can facilitate training and testing of AI models, allowing researchers to explore broader range of possibilities. It could be also useful for data augmentation and enhancement, okay, which could improve the robustness and generalization capability of all AI models, leading to more accurate and reliable results. Okay, you can use it for simulation and scenario testing. Okay, so where we can enable creation of realistic simulation uh, scenarios for testing and validation process. Okay, specifically, if you look at autonomous vehicle, robotics, aerospace, okay, deep fix can generate synthetic sensor data, simulating various environmental condition and scenarios, which will allow researchers to evaluate performance and robustness of their system in a controlled and reproducible manner. It can also be uh, useful for performance by benchmarking, means to uh, benchmark the performance of detection and authentication algorithms. Uh, by generating realistic deep fakes, researchers can evaluate the effectiveness of ex existing detection techniques and develop more robust countermeasures for the same. So understanding deep fakes, okay, is very, very important. Okay, deep fakes shed light on the vulnerabilities and the risk associated with the synthetic media. By exploring the technical aspects and potential impact of the uh, deep fakes, okay, researchers can gain deeper understanding about the challenges that they pose. They can understand the crucial of the, um, developing effective mitigation strategies, raising awareness, and so on. And at last, I can just say that, okay, innovation is another uh, area that we can see. So the exploration of the deep fakes opens the door to innovation and applications and future advancement. By leveraging the deep learning techniques, researchers can develop new methods for content synthesis, manipulation, analysis, etc., and so on. They can lead to novel ways of visualizing data, creating immersive visualization environment, advancing human computer in interactions, etc., and so on. Okay, so there's a lot of potential and a lot of opportunities. Okay, so now let me talk about unleashing the opportunities further. Okay, you'll see that there are various areas in which you can actually see the opportunities. You can have opportunities in the healthcare research. Okay, it could be instrumented in generating the synthetic media. Okay, uh, specifically the medical data offering invaluable opportunities for healthcare research. Okay, this synthetic data can assist in training and diagnostic and preventive uh, predicting the models for improving the healthcare outcomes. You can use it in the finance industry uh, where you can use it for fraud detection and risk management. You can simulate fraudulent activities. Financial institution can basically refine their detection algorithm and security measures for safeguarding the assets. Autonomous vehicle is another important place where you can actually use it. Okay, so simulated scenario, including the complex and uh, rare driving situations. Okay, you can help to train self-driving system more comprehensively. Natural language processing is another key area where you can actually use it. Okay, so large scale, diverse and realistic text and voice data can be used to improve the accuracy and the fluency of the language models. Large language models are basically working on that. Climate modeling and prediction is another area where simulations can help the researchers to bet better understand climatic phenomena and develop more precise forecasting models. Uh, manufacturing and quality control is another place where simulations okay, enable manufacturer to identify the weakness, streamlining the process and ensure the product quality. Okay, so you see that these are all of the areas where you can actually use the deep fakes, okay, for your own benefits, okay, or to the benefit of science and academia and the research. But the thing is that you need to understand that we need to have a responsible use 
okay, for positive impact. So while deep fakes offer immense opportunity, their responsible use or responsible use is of paramount importance. Ensuring ethical practices, consent, and the transparency is going to be vital to maintain the trust in the digital age. So I can say that the fusion of deep learning and the deep fake has basically unlocked unprecedented possibilities across various sectors, uh, from healthcare to finance, transportation, research, and much more beyond. However, it is essential to harness this technology responsibly, adhering to the ethical guidelines to harness the positive impact while impacting the potential risk and the challenges. The future holds even more potential for innovation and positive transformation with deep fakes, provided they are going to be used widely and ethically. Okay, so that's very, very important that you need to be ethical, in fact. Now, some of the scientific breakthroughs that are aided by the deep fakes, okay, it is worth mentioning. So if you look at the synthetic biology, okay, some of the examples of the deep fake has aided in breakthrough in synthetic bi biology, such as design of novel genetic circuits. Okay, researchers at Stanford University used deep learning technique to generate synthetic DNA sequences, which was able to enable the construction of synthetic bacterial genome with enhanced functionality and potential application in, say, bio-based material production and so on. Drug discovery is another important area where scientists at uh, Toronto has employed um, a deep learning algorithm to generate synthetic compound for uh, virtual screening. Uh, this approach basically led to identification of promising drug candidate for treatment of neurodegenerative diseases, expediting the development of potential okay, consequences and so on. Material science is another place where it has been used at MIT. You will see that deep learning technique has been used to simulate the synthetic material with desired properties. Okay, combining with the nanotechnology, they are able to generate something new. Okay, so they discovered a new class of lightweight yet strong material that could actually revolutionize the aerospace and automotive industry. Protein folding is another area where you'll see that it has been used. Okay, so DeepMind's AlphaFold, again, okay, AI system which is leveraging the deep learning, accurately predicted the 3D structure of the proteins. Okay, this breakthrough in the protein folding prediction has become uh, a revolutionizing uh, aspect in drug discovery and understanding of various theses. Quantum computing is another area where people are working with the deep learning. Climate modeling, as I have already told you, it can be used. So if I just say that these are all real world examples which demonstrated how deep fakes have aided the scientific breakthrough. Okay, from scientific bio, uh, say synthetic biology to drug discovery to material science, uh, protein folding to quantum computing to um, climate modeling, deep fakes have accelerated the research enabling the discoveries and advancement with far reaching impl implications by leveraging the deep mind, uh, deep learning uh, based uh, synthetic capabilities scientists are basically pushing the boundaries of the scientific understanding and paving the uh, say way to transform uh, transformative and uh, what do you say ever uh, uh, never ending kind of uh, uh, evolution for the future in fact now since i have mentioned about some of benefits and where you can actually use it let me talk about some of the threats in the deep fix in science okay so i although i have uh, by and large already discussed it okay so these are some of the areas where you will see that uh, the challenges are going to be in front of us okay so we will be having deceptive manipulation of the media and i will not be able to identify whether it is a real or fake okay erosion of scientific integrity was another concern okay damage to public trust ethical concerns are going to be there and so on. Okay, so all these things are going to be one of the uh, few of the challenges that you need to de uh, deal with when we are uh, discussing about the deep fix in science or academia or research. Okay, when I'm saying science, it doesn't mean that science is only for physics, chemistry, biology or computer science or something like that. Even for psychology, even for literature or something, everything, because I see everything that is around us is actually some or the other form of science. I guess you'll see that wherever you are going to have synthetic and the synthetic, which is as good as a real, sometimes the line is going to cross and we may go on to the darker side of our data that we are going to deal with. Okay, so therefore I should be must, must con concerned with. Now, the thing is that if I have the opportunities, I have the challenges, then the question arises as an academia or as a researcher. Okay, so what you can do? Okay, so you can basically attempt to detect deep fakes. Okay, as a novice person or as, as a person who is uh, uh, fully involved in this. So you'll see that deep fake detection 
uh, basically MCOM, encompasses or contains basically a range of techniques and the strategies that aim to identify the synthetic and manipulated media spanning across different types of content such as image, video, audio, or any other kind of uh, um, uh, any other kind of uh, uh, textual information. So the emergence of the defect has raised significant concerns across various domains, uh, as I have already mentioned. So let me just go into a little bit about uh, the same. So if you talk about the techniques of the detection, you'll see that people have been attempting into facial analysis, voice analysis, okay, textual analysis. All of these are the areas where people are trying to detect fakes because most of the fakes are entering into this domain. Okay, you have the face or the images. Okay, you have videos, you have voice, you have the text data and so on. So all of these areas there, you have some techniques that you need to develop. Okay, you need to identify the inconsistencies into the facial features, unnatural movement to identify the fake videos. Okay, facial recognition algorithms, uh, landmark detection and comparison of facial attributes, they are going to be employed in detecting the discrepancies between the real and the manipulated face. If you talk about the voice analysis, okay, you, you will see that you will be assessing the audio characteristics, speech pattern, inconsistencies, uh, to detect the synthesized and the manipulated voices in the deep fake audios. Speaker recognition algorithm and voice synthetic techniques okay, can help you to identify anomalies and detect potential voice manipulations. If you talk about textual analysis, so in that case, uh, you can involve uh, the examination of writing style, linguistic pattern, and other kind of inconsistencies in order to identify artificially generated or manipulated textual content. Okay, so people are writing things from chat GPT or something like that. Okay, you see that now you have a challenge to identify whether it is machine generated or whether it is human generated kind of things. So in that case, even in the text domain, you'll find out the defects have entered. Now, if you talk about the strategies to uh, defect detection, okay, you'll see that all those algorithms that we have basically discussed earlier, which was used for generating this, okay, are going to be again used for containing it or uh, mitigating it. Okay, so machine learning algorithms like CNN, okay, to RNNs, to GANs, okay, to autoencoder, all of them are going to be used for defect detection. So these algorithms, basically, they are going to be trained on the large data sets to learn the pattern and identify the anomalies in the media content. Meta uh, data analysis and contextual analysis is another interesting area where you can work on, where you can look into the, uh, what do you say, metadata associated with the media content like timestamps, geolocation data, author information, et cetera, and so on. And it can help you to identify the authenticity and origin of the content and identify the potential inconsistencies and the manipulation. Okay, if you talk about the contextual analysis, it is one of the very favorite and uh, very uh, close area for a long time uh, to me. I guess you'll see that you can actually analyze contextual surrounding uh, the content and cross-referencing the reliable sources and examining the content's consistency. Uh, and it can aid in identifying the potential deep fakes and in, uh, instances of any type of information. So if you look at the deep fake detection, it is very, very significant in the, uh, what is the domain of academia and research. Okay, if you want to uh, say preserve the trust Okay, if you want to mitigate any kind of misinformation attempts, okay, if you want to uh, reinstate the, um, what do you say, individual's uh, integrity and uh, scientific integrity. Okay, so you'll see that that is a, uh, going to be a very, very important thing that you need to be concerned about. So all those people who are from the field of information technology, computer science, okay, so they may be uh, interested in working this because this is a technology of not future, but as of now, it is current. Okay, so you cannot neglect the current. So you have to start from the current and then you have to build for your future. So you have to be very, very proactive. I have already mentioned about some of the algorithms that are basically used for fake defect detection. Okay, I've already uh, discussed that. So, sorry, yeah. So these are some of the algorithms that I will be, uh, uh, we we have in fact discussed. I will be not going into too much of detail uh, details because of the shortage of the time. And um, if I just talk about some of the real world examples of uh, other examples of the deep fakes in scientific research, okay. So I have just mentioned on that. So it has uh, been seen in manipulated microscopic images, okay. So which was basically uh, used to enhance the perceived efficacy of the new uh, drug treatment. Okay, so now these manipulated images showcase a greater reduction in the cell's viability. 
leading to an exaggerated claim of the drug's eff effectiveness. So now you say that people were publishing their research. Okay, this you have to see that whether they have they have really worked on to the real data or whether it was a fabricated or the fake data. Okay, so this is some of the uh, what do you say um, um, actual cases okay I have, uh, the identity is not being revealed because of the ethical concern but these are actual cases which have been identified and which have been brought to the light falsified climate data change data was also being experimented okay and uh, in one of the instances the manipulated uh, what is a climate model was used to show significant increase in the global temperature anomalies and the fake induced alterations were difficult to detect due to the complex nature of the climate data analysis and involvement in the sophisticated models Okay, synthetic result in genomic uh, research was allowed under the area where uh, synthetic data was trying to mimic the DNA sequence and the variations. Okay, they were incorporated into the study, resulting into false genetic association and misleading conclusions. So distinguishing between the synthetic results from authentic data was very much challenging as the fake techniques produce realistic genetic pattern in fact. Okay, so and it was very, very difficult to identify. Fabricated neuroimaging, okay, that was basically the functional MRI research, okay, that was there. And uh, there it was basically falsified. Fraudland research papers have been produced where there is no actual research, but people have uh, generated deep fake, generated content, okay, uh, for the scientific research and it has led to a lot of um, uh, wrong interpretations. And you will see that there are other kind of clinical trial data also that have been available. Okay, so where people have fabricated and altered the patient data to show more favorable outcomes for the particular treatment or the drug. Okay, particularly the private industry, okay, specifically in the medical domain, now is quite interested in this, okay, because they want to show a lot of uh, uh, falsified things in order to boost their outcomes or uh, their efficiency of the hospitals because there are competitions between the hospitals also and which is very, very dangerous, uh, uh, what is a um, uh, thing that is going to be uh, coming in future and uh, which should, should be alarming. Detecting this manipulation can be quite challenging, uh, especially uh, specifically when alterations are going to be done in such a way that it disguises within the larger data set. So the consequences of such deep fake manipulation can have serious implication for medical decision making and the patient care. So all these examples that I have just given you, they tell you the diverse ways in which the deep fakes can inf inter infiltrate into scientific research and uh, the manipulated aspects vary from image uh, and data to entire research studies. Detecting such manipulation can be challenging due to various factors such as sophistication of deep fake techniques, complexity of scientific data analysis, or the subtle nature of the alterations that you are going to have. Okay, so you'll see that the presence of the expected variation in the data can be another uh, interesting and challenging problem. So the reliance on the digital formats and the lack of standardization uh, verification methods can make it difficult to identify the deep fakes. Uh, robust uh, transparent practices, rigorous uh, uh, peer reviews and integration of uh, uh, advanced uh, dis uh, detection techniques are going to be essential to mitigate the risk which is posed by this fix in the scientific research and maintain the integrity of the scientific community. So if I just uh, show you that this is basically the trend in which the defect is invading our life okay, from 2015. If you, I just, if you remember, I just told you that 2015 and 16 was the time when the deep learning and the deep fix to be very specific came into the existence. And from that point in time, you'll see there's a linear increase in the uh, use of the deep fix in the entertainment industry. Okay, constantly it is being using. But however, you will see that very recently the trend for scientific research and the content creation has seen a big leap. Now, you will see that equally, equally and in fact more okay, contents and the scientific research are now using the defects for good purpose, for bad purpose, both. Okay, so I'm not going to segregate that as, as of now, but that's what the trend is as of now. I guess you'll see that at 2030 or so, you'll see that it may be surpassing okay, your expectations uh, in many of the cases. Now, let me talk about basically the ethical uh, implications of the defects in the scientific uh, publication at large. Okay, I have already discussed much of them, in fact. Okay, you'll see that uh, uh, defects have been used for manipulation of the data and results leading to inaccurate conclusions. 
Now, if you are going to use the same in inaccurate conclusion and you are relying on to uh, these uh, results for your further research, it could go in the wrong way. And at some point in time, you'll come to say, uh, come to a point where you'll say that, oh, where we have come, okay, and we have gone into the altogether wrong discussion. In the literature survey, people say that you read other people's work so that you know that what is the current uh, benchmark or milestones or what kind of work is happening. Now, imagine that if you are going to have all wrong literature being studied, so what kind of research you are going to take and you are going to move ahead. So breach of research ethics uh, is another important thing. Okay, so uh, defect violate the core principles of research ethics, such as honesty and the transparency. Whatever is there, okay, you need to report it. Okay, and you'll see that science, science ka core ya heart jo hai, wo hai aapki rationality. Science is another term for rationality. Whatever is right is right, wrong is wrong. Okay, that is what you have to report. Okay, so in that case, ethics has to be there and it need to be mentioned all the time. Okay, compromise peer review. This is an another area you will see that you will have challenge. Now, deep fakes can basically deceive the peer review process, compromising the rigor and the quality of the scientific evaluation. Earlier, we had cases where there were no review happening. Now, even if people want to do the peer review, what they are reviewing, they do not know whether it is fake or it is going to be real. So peers may unknowingly review and approve manipulated research leading to dissemination of false and unreliable information. That's going to be one of the very, very challenging problems. So therefore, you see that there's going to be damage to scientific reputation at large. It will it is going to erode the public trust in the scientific enterprise at large, and it will raise the doubts about the validity of the scientific finding, findings. And many of uh, us in this group, okay, who are attending, okay, you'll see that you have been doing a lot of research over the past period of time, okay, few decades, and you see that from where you have started and where we have come, okay, so it is going to be really a scary things if you are not ready to handle these things, whether you are going to be a guide, whether you are going to be a student, okay, both of you are going to have a challenge as far as the fakes are concerned. So it is going to have a negative impact on the collaborative efforts also. So you'll see that it is going to harm the collaborative research effect efforts uh, by introducing the fraudulent or manipulated data into the shared data sets and research collaboration. You see that people are now publishing data sets, okay? In the research, you'll see that the most important thing that you are having or the problem that you are going to have is the accessibility of the data. People are not having the data. Now you just see that if the data is readily available, you will use that, you will work onto that and you'll produce a result which is actually absolutely going to be absurd or is going to be wrong. Now imagine that I'm going to pre present my data set onto the Kaggle data set with everybody is relying. Now, people will use it, okay, they will say that this is what the pattern is, and I will train my classifiers and everything onto that, and I am going to produce my results. Now, imagine that if you are using such kind of models, and you are going to treat a patient, if you are going to uh, detect a fraud into the banking sector, if you are going to send uh, Chandrayaan onto the space, you'll see that what can happen. Okay, instead of going to the moon, it may be going to somewhere else and it may be lost. So it is going to be loss of money, loss of um, efforts, lot of loss of uh, uh, loss of credits, and much more. So it's you see that the the more the the, the less the benefit, more the what is a uh, drawbacks or the disasters can happen if you do not follow the ethical uh, standards and the practices while using the defects. So the question of maintaining the integrity becomes very, very important in upholding the ethical standards of the scientific inquiry and ensuring the credibility and trustworthiness of the scientific publications. Okay, you'll see the researchers must adhere to established guidelines, ethical guidelines, including the informed consent, uh, responsible data management and accurate reporting of methods and the results. If you are using any kind of content which are generated by AI, you need to mention that it is a AI generated content. Now, many of the journals, they are now accepting that you have taken the help of the AI generator. Okay, but you need to mention and you need to uh, acknowledge that. Okay. And you'll see that conducting research with rigor and robust experimental design and appropriate statistical analysis may be able to help you to ensure that accuracy and the reliability of your findings. Uh, transparently, you should report the limitation and uncertainties. Uh, it can help you to prevent misinterpretation and misrepresentation of the results. Okay. Particularly when you talk about peer review process, it will play a very critical role in maintaining the research integrity by evaluating the validity and uh, integrity of the scientific publications. So you should encroach, uh, say, en um, I can say that uh, you should encourage the reproducibility, uh, sharing of the data and the methods. 
which will foster the open dialogue uh, and uh, it will contribute to the verification and the validation of all these research findings. Okay, so you'll see that there's an ethical responsibility of uh, you and me as a researcher and, and as a student, as an academic uh, person. Okay, so we should be very much keen that uh, we should uh, be made aware about the uh, potential for the deep fake manipulations, uh, stay informed about the emerging detection uh, techniques and ethical guidelines. Uh, institution at large, you will see that they are going to play a very, very important role in providing the education, training, and resources to the uh, to support the researchers in navigating and uh, these ethical challenges. And this workshop or this uh, webinar is part of that effort. And I should congratulate the uh, uh, this Women Scientists Association for taking this um, effort for the same. Next thing that I should mention that the adoption of the safeguard measures. Okay, so you should adopt safeguard uh, measures such as data authentication methods, detection and preventing the inclusion of deep fakes into scientific publications. Okay, we should encourage use of open science practices, data sharing, collaboration, all this can basically help you uh, to achieve your objective. Institutions at large, they should enable the ethical and uh, say oversight mechanism, including research ethics committee and uh, integrity offices, uh, to promote uh, responsible ethics and address uh, potential ethical breaches at if any at any point in time. So you'll see that this is going to be a very wider context that one should be concerned with when you are going to talk about the deep fix. Now, another last part that I want to discuss is that navigating the copyright challenges in the age of defects and the AI. Now, I see that now today you are going to have a problem that what do you call as an original and what is going to be called as a, uh, what is a defects. Now, syn generating synthetic data is a part of our research in many of the cases. You'll find out that in such situation, you will find out that we are in a situation where we are having an ever evolving uh, landscape of artificial intelligence and the legal framework play a crucial role in shaping this AI innovation and addressing the potential harm. So as AI technologies, particularly generative AI can uh, continue to advance, existing law must uh, adapt to strike a balance between the encouraging, uh, uh, encouraging use of beneficial uh, use of AI progress and say the safeguarding at the same time, again, the potential risk. So uh, you see that uh, one prominent uh, example of legal complexity uh, is the intersection of the generative AI and the copyright laws, which present the challenges that impact the business and the innovation. So let me just explore a few of them. So you'll see that uh, uh, if you look at the law, okay, so law must foster uh, an environment where AI users can and the developers can push the boundaries of the innovation without facing any kind of legal barriers. Again, mitigating, uh, say, legal framework should be existing there. Okay, we should be designed to address AI's potential negative consequences. Okay, and um, uh, safeguarding the individual and the society at large. Ambiguities in the uh, copyright laws related to generative AI okay, may impede the uh, business understanding of the legal boundaries and uh, leading to his, uh, resistant uh, progress. And uh, many of the time you'll find out that if something is being generated artificially, who is going to own the copyrights for the same? That is going to be one of the biggest challenge. Okay, is it going to be the algorithm um, who is going to own the copyright or the person who has developed the originally the algorithm who is uh, going to use your copyright or a person who has used it? Okay, so content belongs to whom this is going to be one of the biggest problem that you are going to have. So copyright and generative AI is going to be one of the uh, problems. Then um, uh, you'll see that uh, um, if you look at this, then we need to have the regulatory framework at our exposure, uh, which will be able to address all these kind of uh, uh, regulatory challenges, okay, which is uh, an outcome of the generative AI and the deep learning, and I need to have the mitigation strategies uh, for the same. But unfortunately, you will find out in the current context, okay, uh, things are not in place. Okay, so you'll see that as the technology is evolving, okay, we need to address these things from the legal perspective also. And uh, by large, you'll see that there's no regulatory framework uh, standardized, okay, which will be able to handle at this stage. But people have started working on to this and trying to get onto 
uh, what do you say, some kind of consensus model where what is allowed and what is not allowed. Okay, so if you see that some of the key observations that I have just mentioned, okay, there's a legal battle over the AI generated content. Okay, who is going to be the owner? Now you should talk about chat GPT. Chat GPT is trained on to some of the existing data which is publicly available, which was supposed to be publicly available and publicly available data, but they have trained and they are generating content. Now people who have generated that data or they have kept it public. Now they are claiming that you have uh, generated something useful based on our data so you should get a share now there's a legal battle that is happening okay who is going to own that outcome or the product that is coming out of this challenges assumption the AI community okay there are a lot of things that are basically seen sorry uh in the ai community okay so there's a legal action okay which is a challenging uh, the assumptions within the ai community okay that is training the machine learning models by copyrighted work Okay, and sometimes it is permissible under the existing copyright laws. Okay, so there's an uncertainty kind of thing around this issue, which has led to the legal conflict between the content creators and the AI developers. Okay, so people are seeking resolution or uh, resolution for the same. Okay, lawsuits have been filed. AI companies like OpenAI, they have sought a resolution by cutting the deals with the, op uh, by obtaining the permission to use high quality training data and so on. So this is basically indicating that there's a willingness to address the copyright concerns and fostering the cooperation between AI developers and the uh, content holders. And uh, if you look at the legislative examination, okay, so there's a legal implication of AI generated content, okay, and it is gaining the uh, attention from the legislators. Okay, so specifically not in the Indian context, but if you talk about United States, okay, they have held several hearings to explore the implication of the AI on the copyrights and intellectual property laws involving uh, representation from the Adobe, okay, uh, from the Adobe uh, stability of AI and other stakeholders and so on. So you'll see that all these things are there, but there's a lot of complexity in the AI generated uh, contents, okay, which is actually leading to disputes. Okay, um, which is highlighting the need for the clarity in the copyright rules, address the ambiguity around the AI generated content and so on. So there's a huge impact of AI in this case. And that's why you just say that we are not able to basically contain it at this stage because it's an ever evolving process as of now. So it's a quite uh, great challenge to everybody as of now. Then I just... Uh, uh, just uh, summarize that the legal and the policy implication. You'll see that intellectual property infringement is one of the areas that people are concerned with where unauthorized use of somebody else's work can be uh, used with the help of the AI and def defamation and the privacy, privacy right is another thing because now deep learning and deep fix can reveal all those things which were sensitive and which were not publicly available because the machine is now capable of uncovering all those hidden secrets about you or your work. Okay, so in that the question is going to be you have not revealed it, but it is made available. Okay, so that's why the privacy right is going to be another important pro problem area. You have fraudulent and the identity theft kind of a problem. Uh, then digital right and freedom of experience, uh, expression is another concerned area. You'll see that you need to have a balance between the freedom of expression and so on. In the digital domain, you'll find out these are all creative things and creative things can create anything. Okay, But when you are creating anything which is uh, specific to some person and so on, and it can bring harm, then in that case, the question arises whether you should uh, generate or not. So there's a legal discussion around the defects uh, should consider the balance between protect, uh, protecting individuals and their rights while respecting the freedom of the expression. So striking a balance between protecting individuals from harm and safeguarding rights to freedom of speech is going to be crucial in developing the uh, appropriate legal policy uh, responses. Um, so you see that I have basically uh, started from an introduction to the technology and uh, the opportunities and the threats and now the uh, legal and the copyright and ethical concerns. Now, uh, the webinar will not be complete if I do not talk about the status of the defects laws in India. Okay, in India, you'll find a legal legal framework addressing the defect is still evolving. And in fact, I should say that it is not still there. However, existing laws can be applied to a certain level to address some of the aspects related to defect creation and dissemination. Okay, so we have our own Indian Copyright Law Act, okay, which can help you to protect uh, uh, give you protection from some of the copyright content. However, it is going to be still challenging in the current context. You have Information Technology Act, 
um, then you have the Indian Penal Code, data protection laws, again, and all those things. So they are already existing. Again, you can take some up to certain level of help or a combination of all these provisions in our law in order to safeguard yourself. But please be reminded there is no specific, very concrete thing as of now because the technology itself is evolving. In the last two, three years, okay, you'll find out things have evolved into a very different facet, okay, which is not being imagined by the law regulatory frameworks or the agencies at large. So therefore, you'll see that in Indian context, at least I can say that, okay, we are still at the infant stage, okay, and therefore, we need to be a little bit more concerned. So I've just mentioned that there is no specific policies and the regulation which is governing the defect uh, in science at the global or even at the national level at large. Okay, so there are some broader policies and the regulation that can help you to contain this kind of problems. So you have research ethics guidelines which may promote the integrity in the science, okay, which we have discussed. Okay, then intellectual property laws can be used for protecting the scientific research. Data protection and privacy laws can be used to safeguard the personal information. Scientific journal policies may help you to ensure the scientific integrity. So therefore, the policies have to be revised. Ethical oversight committees can use can be used to basically maintain the research standard. Okay, so these are some of the things that you can basically work with. And if you talk about defect, some of the defect tools, these are some of the popular defect tools which you will be finding over the internet. Okay, you can just talk about. Most of them are basically working with the audio and the video data. However, there are more things that you can work with the text data also. Now, let me talk about the potential consequences on the research and the academia. Okay, I've already mentioned about the same. Okay, so it is going to have the stifling of the scientific progress. Okay, so scientific progress may be hampered to a large, okay, wastage of the funding, damage, reputation, legal and ethical consequences, erosion of public trust. So if you just see that the safeguarding measures, okay, if you look at it, so you need to have a development of robust authentication mechanism. Uh, awareness and education is another important thing. Implementation of best practices in the data management I have discussed, collaboration I have discussed, and advancement in the AI-based uh, detection techniques should be looked into. Now, collaborative strategies okay, can also work in this case. I okay, guess so you'll see that collaboration can be done at different level and a different aspect, in fact. Okay, so you need to advocate for the collaborative approaches and it will help you to okay um, contain this kind of fallbacks that you are going to have. Make people understand what is the importance of collaboration, okay, collaborative actions. Uh, have organizations which can work together, okay, and educate people, involve educational institutions, involve researchers, okay, and also go for the open source collaboration, okay, so that people are aware about whatever is available today. So transparency and open science. Okay, so you'll see that the transparency in science is very, very important. So I just say that promoting transparency and open science is essential for safeguarding scientific integrity and combating the impact of defects in academia and research. Okay, you see that the transparency could be used for mitigating the uh, mitigating the defects from various dimensions. Okay, it can be used for scrutinizing the defects, detection algorithms, open sharing of techniques, and the data can help you out identifying sometimes the biases and the vulnerabilities which have been presented by somebody else's work, fostering trust in AI driven research. Okay, so we cannot just overlook look any of the AI driven research. Okay, you need to accommodate that, but you need to have developed the trust. Importance of open science, I have just mentioned. Okay, so facilitates reproducibility and verification, addressing effectiveness of uh, mitigation strategies, improving overall research uh, quality, and advance uh, advancing the society benefit. Okay, so I'm not going to go into detail because of the shortage of the time. Some of the examples which are trustworthy in scientific practices, you'll see the detailed explanation of the research papers or releasing the pre-trained models and the data set for other people to try it out. Collaborative process uh, projects and shared uh, findings can be useful, fostering trust and collaboration in the research. Okay, so these are the some of the things that may help you to develop the transparency, okay, in the research and the academia. So the science communication and the public, okay, uh, Ethics is something which is going to be thing. So you need to uh, highlight the significance of science communication in the defect awareness. Okay, so if you are able to raise the public awareness, okay, so in that case, it can help you to have a coexistence of the defect for good and at the same time mitigation for the same for the bad. 
role of the public engagement in countering the misinformation is going to be very large because these are the people who are the stakeholders which are directly involved or they are going to be directly uh, impacted. So they should be made aware in order to identify and question the suspicious content, okay? So whether it is coming on the WhatsApp forward or Facebook or any of the public platforms. Okay, you should utilize the relatable examples and visuals in order to convey the complex concept and identify anything which is, uh, what is a uh, non, uh, what is a real, okay? So I have already discussed about the peer review and publishing standards and the technological so solutions can be one of the ways to deal with it along with the ethical uh, uh, this. So coming to the uh, uh, summary, summary of this, what we have discussed today is that we have talked about uh, uh, what are defects and how defects are basically an outcome of deep learning and how deep learning is revolutionizing the research. At the same time, it is also posing the significant challenge to the scientific community, including academia and the research. And we have also discussed about the basic working model behind all these kind of content creation or the defect creation and also the detection. We have discussed about the what are the opportunities okay, for researchers, academia and the science at large and at the same time, what are the uh, threats that you have. We have also showcased some of the live examples where defects have been used in scientific studies for good as well as for some bad. Okay, and we have also explored uh, the what is the importance of research ethics, okay, ethical considerations, copyright, regulatory framework, and so on. But at large, you will see that at the end, if I have to say, it is an evolving field, okay. At this point in time, it is uncontrollable. Even if you want to control it, it is free in some other dimension. So therefore, you have to keep your eyes and ears open, okay, so that at least you'll be able to identify what is fake and what is real. Okay, so with that, I come to the rest of my presentation. And uh, I hope I could uh, give you some insights into one of the very important and um, what is an interesting topic of the current time. I've been working with this for quite long. So when the phase was being coined in the early days in 2014, 15, okay, so we have been working into similar areas okay, for a quite large time. So thank you for thank you for listening to me. And once again, I thank the Department of Information Technology and the Women Scientists Association for giving me opportunity to basically speak on uh, something which I like and I am working on. So thank you once again. And if you have any questions, please go ahead. Thanks. Thank you so much, sir, Thank for so this much. informative topics related to deepfakes. A quiz regarding the topics discussed in the webinar is being posted in the chat box, requesting all the participants to kindly drop your response because your certificates will be generated on those basis. Meanwhile, let us move to the question answer session and the chat box is open for your brainstorming questions. So participants, if you have any questions, you can ask Rajesh, sir, he's there to answer your questions. See, one of the drawback of the uh, online media is that people don't interact. <laughs> no, 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 no. I myself actually uh, <laughs> uh, had a question that uh, you yeah, have yeah. Uh, given so many uh, dimensions uh, to the deep fix. And uh, as an academician, as a uh, grown ups in the education field, uh, we always wonder that uh, how we are going to handle with this. Uh, so I have one question like, I mean, other day when I was reviewing. Uh, as you said correctly, uh, the uh, papers, research papers for the international conferences, then how you can find out the paper is generated by chat GPT or it is human written? <laughs> See, as of now, I am telling you, we are still in the evolving stage. There is no perfect tool, okay, which can help you to identify even the open AI Okay, they also try to come up with their own tool okay, to generate their own work, but they have taken it back. 
okay so for your information they have taken it back and they say that we are still not able to 100% say that it is our own okay except saying that if they have into their database they can compare it if if they are, if you are not storing it it is really difficult because we are becoming so natural now only thing that you can see as an individual as a human being you see that as a human being we have lot of shortfalls or we have limitations in our capacity to represent to remember to reproduce and try as hard you cannot be uh, highly accurate as machine models can be because i consider myself again okay, very admiring of the machine learning in fact uh, when i started my academic career in 2002 when i took for the first class when i took the ai i asked a question to my first batch of students the first class that who is intelligent human beings or the machines and as usual people always say that the human being because we are the creators okay but that point in time i had an answer in 2002 that you are all wrong machine is more intelligent because it cannot make mistakes provided it has been given right inputs and you as a human being you are going to have a shortfall aapki kamiyan pakdi ja sakti hai machine ki pakdna difficult hoga so and just why you see that from there to here we have come and if you see that even chat gpt or other to the chat gpt is only one of the tool there have been hundreds of things that are actually happening okay i'll just show you one of the data sets just now okay which is actually generated okay synthetically or deep fake okay and it is a financial data detecting some kind of uh, patterns into this now if somebody is using this data now tell me what is going to happen right. so you will see that if you are coming uh, across some kind of reviewing process please be assured that you will never be able to identify 100% but you can use your intuition saying that okay, how can somebody be so accurate how can somebody be so grammatically correct okay best of the best people still they make mistake even if you talk about sashi tarur also okay he is also likely to make at some or the other place okay although he is considered to be the ideal in english speaking or something like that the choice of words and other kind of thing okay there are certain exception i will say that he can use such big words but people like us if we start using the very good work and very right context it is really very difficult because i have been brought into a, a medium where even english was taught in uh, say hindi okay our teachers used to tell okay this is a past and beta isko ed lagate hai action hota hai to ing lagate hain something like that so i cannot improve to a that level i may still make some mistakes and another thing is that when you are looking at the results okay you see that if somebody is claiming that they have got perfect results okay i, see, I have seen that most of the this bogus uh, journals okay the so called uh, fake journals okay in fact you will see that before deep fake came okay the uh, fake journals already had started because of our ugc uh, requirement So you'll say that people are claiming ninety nine percent, what do you say, um, uh, accuracy, hundred percent accuracy, and something like that. We see that the kind of a problem, and how can they can be hundred uh, percent? Okay, so that is an indication that it is not. Even if you see that most of the model, okay, you are uh, from a mathematics and computer science, you'll see that any of the models, whether you start with the naive base to the most advanced model, they will talk about sixty six to eighty three, eighty three to ninety three, or something like that kind of accuracy. They never go to hundred percent. because we ourselves is not in a position to give the correct data or the correct context to the machine itself so that's something uh, i think uh, the chat box is flooded with questions maybe student coordinator uh, if you can read out some of the questions sir can answer them uh, yes ma'am uh, sir one of the questions is how can we protect ourselves from deep deep fake attacks See, as far as the deep fake attacks is concerned, I'll say that these are two important areas where you may be attacked. Okay, one is the visual, another is the audio, and all those people who are keeping their camera off at this point in time, they have done very intelligent work. Okay, so try to be not in public, in voice. or video or image okay all those people who are posting their photographs on instagram facebook videos etc and so on please be assured and i'm guaranteeing you that every piece of image that you have posted every video that you have posted everything that you have said is being consumed okay and it is not used for only good purpose it is also used for bad purpose so if you see that your image your photograph your video is actually available at where it should not be so try to minimize your presence again form of audio or video wherever it is possible 
Okay. So if you are clicking photograph, please try to see that you do not have solo photographs being posted. Or if you are having, try to have in such that it can cannot be misused. Okay, but I know that today it is very difficult. Okay, because your presence is also important, but you need to be a little bit aware. Okay, come se come agar ap share karte ho, to ap protect kar sakte ho. And then you need to have a detection tool which can help you to identify whether it was uh, real or fake. Okay, but it's very, very challenging. So somebody is saying 100% perfect content is most probably generated. Okay, mistakes, this is a human feature. Yes, perfectly. Okay, if something is 100% accurate, it is more likely to be, uh, say, fake data. Yeah. Sir, one of the questions is, what are the positive aspects of deep fakes? Uh, I have already covered the positive aspects. Uh, I'll say that it can be used for simulated learning. Simulations can be used for understanding complex phenomena where people cannot go or it is hazardous, data collection is not possible and so on and so on. In fact, I have been working into a lot of uh, such kind of things where we cannot reach to physical locations. And if we have some limited amount of data about that place, then based on that, we can actually generate some fake data and our research or the experimental results can be uh, uh, modeled onto that. And once you are fully uh, assured of your work, then in that case, you can then take a effort and then go and uh, test it onto the real data. So in that case, it will save a lot of money and the efforts. Okay, so specifically in the classrooms, if you are trying to teach some kind of phenomena, it could be really useful. However, you have to have thin line between that key. Uh, fake should be labeled as fake. So you need to say that it is a fake thing. Okay, but the thing is that there is two things. Okay, synthetic and uh, you have fake. Okay, synthetic is something which is artificially generated. Okay, but it is told that it is synthetic. Okay, it has nothing to do with the realism. Okay, the moment it is going to uh, come closer to the realism, you will see that it becomes a deep fix. And people start substituting the, the synthetic data, which is more realistic, okay, in place of the actual real, uh, real things. Yeah. Uh, sir, one of the questions says that, how do we know that we have been attacked? Uh, now, if you talk about how do you know uh, that there are multiple dimensions, okay, I do not know in which context he has said that, okay, if you are talking about uh, your presence in the network, okay, so there are various techniques and the tools which can help you to identify that your, okay, location or your data or this have been compromised, okay, based on certain statistical and other kind of techniques, we can identify that there's some kind of intrusion that has happened. And um, that's the way you can identify and if you come across some content okay which is pertaining to you then in that case you can use such kind of tools okay which is still at the infinitary stage okay may not be 100 percent possible to identify as of now but you can attempt this kind of tool to identify that uh, it is fake or not okay but as far as attack is concerned there are larger dimensions please understand that uh wala aapko limited way mein bacha sakta hai lekin aapko marne wale ke paas infinite tarika hai marne ka so the best thing that you want to do is that try to be less public as possible. So uh, you are safe. Sir, even I have a question that uh, can deep fakes make simulations more realistic? Yes, 100%. It will be making to a level that you will not be able to identify that it is real or fake. Okay, I, I'll just show you a few of the things. Let me just share my uh, screen. Uh, okay, most of you must have come across this site. Okay, this person does not exist. Okay, you'll see that it is using basically the style gam. And it is able to generate people. Okay, these people do not exist on this earth, actually. They have been all generated looking at the existing data and trying to generate. Now, take an example. Suppose if you are taking it to the genetic research, okay, you can have gene sequencing and other kind of things in some way, and you can actually get something out of the context. And so you, that is why you say that the power of the fic is, and it could be so realistic that it is going to be very difficult to identify that it is not the, what is a, what is a uh, the fake one? It, it will look like a real one. 
right? And I'll just show you something more. Uh, now look at this data. This is basically a data which is related to financial things, okay, spending category and something like that. And there was a small amount of data that was available. And we could understand the pattern and we could actually generate the data. And it was basically a task of doing the classification. So we wanted to develop a classifier which will identify okay, about the spending pattern of the person and then devising some of the things and so on. So now whatever data you see here, actually every piece of data is fake data, okay? I'm telling you, okay, what is the potential? It's not only the audio or video, okay? It is even the, not only the text data, even the Excel sheets, even the formulas, even everything can be faked now. Now imagine that if I'm just going to feed this file to my knife-based classifier or uh, support vector machine, if I'm feeding it to decision tree classifiers, if I'm going to send it to random forest, I'm going to send it to any other ensemble like techniques. I'm not talking about the deep learning, RNN and CRN and other kind of things, okay? Even for the simple machine learning algorithms also. They will be giving you wonderful result and no one can tell you that this result, this data is fake. Out of this data, you'll find out that nobody will be able to tell that this is a fake data. It will be very difficult to tell you that this is a fake data because this is exactly simulating how the actual data was being, what do you say, accumulated or accepted. So that's what you just see that the power is. And this is the data which I have generated, okay, for your information, just for doing experimental thing and so on. If you see, just, that, just, just one more thing. Okay, you'll see that if you want to talk about generation of something, okay, you'll see that uh, uh, artificial Im images or something like that. See how it learns, okay? And this is physically generated on my machine. And in fact, for doing the deep learning experiments and so on, I thought that my existing i7 uh, uh, with 16 GB RAM and 2 TB hard disk and all these things is going to be insufficient. So what I did, I got an another new machine, okay? That this machine currently what I am giving a presentation is, it is basically 64 GB RAM, okay, 4 TB SSD, i9, and uh, RTX 30 NVIDIA, uh, RTX uh, 3080 Ti 16 GB graphics GPU. So at this point in time, my memory, okay, the RAM or the processing memory is near about 90 GBs. 64 GB is a RAM, Okay, some virtual memory and other gra integrated graphics. Okay, that is 90 GB directly without the cache. So if I have to use all kind of this kind of work, so in that case, I need to have a powerful supporting mechanism. Okay, if you do not have a supporting, uh, say, infrastructure, then in that case, deep fakes and all those things, it's going to be very limited things. And I don't think that most of the people are having this kind of infrastructure. I have got this machine basically, okay, in four seven nine nine dollars that amounts near about four lakhs or something like that. Because I was interested, so I started working on this and I could spend on that. That's the thing that I just wanted to show. So all these things are basically the uh, fake that we have generated. Sir, we have one more question. Can a Turing yeah. computing machine or AI can solve halting problem? Yeah, answer is yes. I will say any answer when you come to the domain of science is yes. Only what is not in your control is the current time. Okay. I am saying yes. If it is not possible now, in the next few months, it will be or a year or so. So everything is possible. Whatever you can think of, I am telling you, weird ho, absurd ho, ya kaisa bhi ho. Agar koi cheez aap soch sakte hai, to science mein wo possible hai. Okay, ye man ke chaliye, ye mein bol raun. And it is a word that I'm speaking with 100% claim. If you can think of something, whatever correct, non-correct, absurd, ridiculous, everything is possible. So, yaha to Turing machine or halting machine ke baare ke baat kar rahe hao, which is very much possible. I'm a person from compiler design, system software, so I know that it is very much possible. It's a matter of only computing power and 
what infrastructure you are going to have. So we are going to actually have in quantum computing and all those things. You see what is going to happen in next few years. Yes, sir. Thank yeah. you so much. So we are done with the question and answer session.